Um, I was joking with the people this week, I'm trying to le speak Singlish, uh, but I'm not d very good at it. And uh, the key to Singlish I've understood is to emphasize the last syllable, like ticking. And uh, we're, we're going to go ticking and swimming. And, uh, but it doesn't sound right when I say it. So <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just speak with my southern accent. But uh, I'm from the southern part of the United States. I grew up in a, um, in a stable family with my mother and father. Uh, did not, uh, I, I attended church as a boy. I attended actually a Presbyterian church growing up, but I never really understood the gospel message until I was uh, 17 years old. And I became a Christian my first year of college. I went to a school in Charleston, South Carolina called the Citadel. It's a military school. And so uh, just like your young men do military service, I spent four years in a military college. It was during that time that I became a believer and I began to grow spiritually and felt a sense of God's calling to preach and uh, graduated and I <coughs> did not have to go in to do m military service and so I went into the ministry training and I went to Bob Jones University in Greenville, South Carolina. So I'm actually from South Carolina. I grew up there, I was raised there, all my education was there. And uh, I attended Bob Jones University in preparation for ministry training. When I was a student there, we had about a thousand men that were studying for the ministry. And uh, this was uh, long before your pastor went there. And um, so I went into the ministry and I worked in a local church as an assistant pastor for five years. And then I began in the ministry as an evangelist. And I began traveling as an evangelist. And we did that for 29 years. Uh, many people would know uh, our ministry because of our musical team that had traveled and we did many recordings. Perhaps you've heard some of those from the Steve Pettit evangelistic team. And so uh, that was our, our ministry. And during that time, we had 57 young people who traveled with us over a period of 20 years. Obviously not all 57 at once, but over a period of 20 years. <coughs> and 42 of them were Bob Jones University graduates. And uh, one of them was uh, uh, one of our first team members uh, was a violinist. She was first chair, first violin from Bob Jones University. That means she's really good. And her name was Christy Rowland, and she had a little brother named Ben Rowland. And uh, Ben Rowland was in your church here. Ben came from a family of nine children. That's a big family. Seven boys and two girls. Christy was one of the girls, and so Christy traveled with us. She traveled with us for six years, and she met her husband on our team. We had ten weddings come off of our team. So the way it works is we, we traveled all over the United States in a van, and so every week we'd travel from church to church. Of course, USA is big, so you're all over. You're a very big place, and we're always traveling. And so they sat in the van together for three years. <laughs> and after three years, the answer is going to either be yes or no. <laughs> and they said yes. They have met, they were married, and now they have five children, and they're serving the Lord in the ministry of evangelism. So <clears throat> that was my job until four years ago. In the spring of 2014, I received a phone call from the chairman of the board of Bob Jones University, Mr. Larry Jackson, who asked me if I would consider uh, applying for the position of president of Bob Jones University. Well, if you have any relationship or knowledge of Bob Jones University, that's an odd request. Because Bob Jones University had, up, up until that time, only four presidents. And all the presidents had the same last name. Do you know what the name was? Jones. Three of them had the same first name. <laughs> so there was Bob Jones Sr., Bob Jones Jr., Bob Jones III, and then the son Stephen Jones. Well, just because of really the providential hand of God, there was a change in the leadership structure, and it was, it was, a, it was an accepted that this is God's will uh, change. And so they began to search for a new president, and my name came up. And of course, it was extremely intimidating because anybody who went to Bob Jones, if they had any sort of um, mind, they would never think that they would become the next president of Bob Jones. And so <clears throat> my wife and I were not that excited about it. We were actually very nervous, and rightfully so. And so we went through a process of interviews and so forth and so on. And so. Uh, the executive committee uh, unanimously voted for me to come to the full board to be approved, and I was voted in on the 8th of May, 2014, and that was four years ago. Uh, so my life has changed a lot since then. 
In some ways, I feel like I do the same thing all the time. It's just a little, it's just a little bigger, a little bit more. And so I'm constantly learning and constantly growing. And one of the things that I'm, I'm most thankful for and one of the things that I'm most moved by is actually the graduates and the alumni that I meet all over the world, all over the world. And because they went to Bob Jones University, we have instantaneous connection. There's already a feeling there, and there's already an emotion there, and what has just amazed me and stunned me is just to meet people all over the world who went through the same experience, who went to the same school, who when I say things, they understand exactly what I'm saying, and God used it in their life and, and how many of them are continuing on to serve God and, and fulfill His will in their life. And so uh, I know we're going to have some fellowship time today after church, which I'm greatly looking forward to. Uh, your pastor sort of said it. I'm, a, I'm, I'm just a very, I feel like I'm a very common person. I'm just a very ordinary person. That was a family that I grew up in. Um, my, I probably grew up in a family of, I, I did grow up in a family of doctors and lawyers. My grandfather was a doctor and I have a couple of uncles that are lawyers. I have a son-in-law that's a lawyer. Every pre college president needs to have a son-in-law that's, that's a lawyer. Uh, so I, I'm very thankful for that background, but primarily and most importantly, uh, I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. I, I'm, I'm really a preacher. That's really my passion and my desire. And, uh, and then I, I get to be in a place really a very unusual place. I was telling your pastor today how unusual Bob Jones University is in all of the world, in all of the world. Uh, first of all, most countries don't have Christian universities. So I don't, I don't think you have one here in Singapore of this nature where you have 40,000 graduates from all over the world and we have a student body that ranges in size between 2,500 and 3,000 students from 42 countries, 50 of our, all of our United States they come from, but they come, what makes them unique is they come from churches like your church, where they've grown up in Christian families and their parents want their children to get a good education and at the same time have a biblical worldview. And so what is Bob Jones all about? And really it's quite simple. What, what, what are we wanting to do? Is, you know, what, what gets us out of bed in the morning? What motivates us? And our goal is to empower people to reach their highest potential for God's glory. That's really what we're trying to do. Uh, if you love people and you want to serve people, you want to make those people successful. I, I don't have the responsibility to do that for everybody, but I do for the students that come in. Every student that walks on, I want to see them empowered to reach their highest potential for God's glory. And we do that through three simple things. We call it the ABCs of Bob Jones. Number one, academic excellence the highest level of academic excellence we can give you. And, what, and what, proves, what proves in many ways the academic excellence of Bob Jones University is not the degree that they get, it's what they do with the degree, degree when they leave. And how many of them go on to the next level, to master's level degree and doctorates. And so I meet people all over the world that are Bob Jones graduates and they have these, they have these crazy doctorates. They're so smart. I feel so humble to be in their presence. The second is the B, A, B, B. B is a biblical worldview. And what makes Bob Jones unique is that we have a biblical worldview thoroughly in all of our classes. We have 23 PhDs in our science department. We have all the ranges of science. We have pre-med, we have nursing, we have uh, molecular biology. We have all of those studies. And yet all 23 of our PhDs who have degrees from all over the world, all 23 of them believe that God created the world in six literal days. Do you know how unusual that is? To go to, a secular to go to a secular university, it's impossible to find it. And Bob Jones University has a thoroughly biblical worldview. And then the C's, ABC's, and I say the C's are plural because there's more than one. And that is we put a high focus on three things. Number one, on character, the development of character. Uh, Bob Jones Sr. said that you didn't come to Bob Jones to learn how to make a living, you came to Bob Jones to learn how to live. Everybody wants to get an education to get a good job, but if you become the right kind of person with the right kind of education, you're gonna be hired to be used because of your character. Secondly, is culture. And we believe that, 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 that we should be a, a cultured kind of a person. We should know how to uh, operate in society. We should, we should be a culture difference maker wherever we go. And then thirdly, is community. And that is the closeness that comes through Christian fellowship. 
And that community is on campus, that community is within the realm of local churches. Bob Jones is not a local church, it's a university. So we support the local churches in the greater Greenville area, the biblical churches that are taking a stand for the Lord and our students go and they serve in those churches. And then they come back after four years with, with a degree that they can go out into the world and make a difference. That's why we're there. That's, that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. And, uh, and then sometimes that's what keeps me up late at night. So all of that for the purpose of God's glory. So that's BJU. That's enough for me to say about it. Like anything today, if you want information, just go online. BJU.edu. That'll give you the information. Well, may we pray this morning and ask God's blessing on our time as we talk about the theme of biblical leadership at home. Father, thank you this morning for your wonderful grace. Thank you for your wonderful word. I pray for your blessing this morning, and I pray that you'll bless your people and strengthen the families and homes. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today is uh, Father's Day, and so it is uh, an opportunity for us, while our minds are thinking about Father's Day, to talk about the family and the home. Let me begin by saying that everything rises and falls on leadership. Things don't just happen, you make them happen. Leadership is influence. And people who influence are both decision makers and they are direction setters. So in a family, leadership is absolutely essential. What does a good leader do? A good leader is a problem solver. You know, I've learned something. People can complain, but they'll never be a leader if they're a complainer. A person who's a leader is one who seeks to solve a problem. Leaders are responsibility acceptors. They don't pass the responsibility on to others. They take it themselves. Leaders are risk takers. It's very easy for people to stay comfortable, safe, status quo. But actually, that's, that's not really true. I think you already know in the city of Singapore with so much business that if a businessman just stays status quo before long, he's going to be in the back of the pack. You have to take risks. Leaders are visionaries. They see things that people don't see. They dream. They plan. Leaders set goals. They don't let the day come at them. They come at the day. Leaders are committed to making others a success. It's not about making you a success. That's not leadership. That's selfishness. Leaders are wanting to make everyone around them a success. We believe in empowering others to reach their highest potential for God's glory. And then leaders take the initiative. They are willing to step out, even in a risk. I think, I think without being too political, I think we at least see a risk taker these last couple of weeks in Singapore. Can you think of two people that were risk takers? <laughs> and somebody took the initiative to try to solve the problem. They had a vision, they have goals, and they're committed to trying to make somebody else a success. So that's leadership. And leadership in the family is obviously important because it's the first institution created by God and found in the Bible. Because when we look in the first pages of the scriptures in the book of Genesis, we discover God's creative and supernatural hand of power to make this world. And then after that, he made man and woman in his own image, and there he established and created the family. So when it comes to the home, when it comes to the family, leadership is essential. And the greatest responsibility that you will ever have in life is to be a spouse and to be a parent. That is the greatest responsibility of life. For a man to become a husband is no small thing. Do you know the root word for husband comes from the old English word husbandman? Do you know what a husbandman was? He was a farmer. He had his own field. He grew his own crops. He tended his own gardens. He took care of things. That's what a husband has to do. He has to take care of things. And for his wife, the husband is to be the provider, to be the protector, and to be the family priest. And so today I want to speak to you on some basic principles of biblical leadership at home. There's no doubt that when you talk about the family, there are cultural elements so that there'll be differences of culture in the family here in Singapore 
especially with your background, your culture, your family, an Asian culture as opposed to a Western culture is going to be somewhat different. And there are going to be distinctions. However, there are basic principles in the scriptures that people in all cultures can benefit from, and I'll do my best to focus this morning on those principles. So let me begin, first of all, by asking the, learning the principles through questions. The first question is this, when it comes to the right kind of home, and that is this, are you a Christian who has a meaningful relationship with God? I cannot be more foundational than that, and that is the most important foundation. Are you a Christian, sir? Are you a Christian, ma'am? And do you have a meaningful relationship with God? The foundation for all human, rela human relationships is our relationship with God. Because relationships should come as an outflow, as an overflow. Each morning I've gotten up in my hotel room and I've either made some coffee or I've made some tea. And uh, in my room, I did not have this in other places I've been, that you have a cup and a saucer. Do you know what the saucer is for? It's for the overflow. Maybe you put too much water in. Maybe the tea spills over. In some ways, our relationship with people should be an overflow of our relationship with God. It really starts on the inside of what God is doing in you so that God can work through you. If I have any philosophy of the Christian life, it is this. God works in you in an order to work through you. The best husband and the best wife doesn't start with their relationship with one another. They start with their relationship with God. It's like a triangle. Here's God, here's the husband, here's the wife. If you get closer to God in a triangle, you will inevitably get closer to one another. So are you a Christian that has a meaningful relationship with God? My wife said to me one day, Steve, I am so glad you pray. I said, why? She said, because when you come out of the prayer closet, you are much sweeter than you were when you went into the prayer closet. When you begin a relationship, it should start with your relationship with God. I have four children. Their ages are 36, 34, 30, and 21. So my, my viewpoint towards my children today is a little bit different than it was 20 years ago. Because when they were teenagers and younger, I had certain concerns about them. Now I have other concerns. One concern, probably the number one concern, is who do they marry? Because when you bring somebody else into your family, that can change the whole dynamic of your family. I'm so thankful for my second daughter who's married. She is, a, she is the director of a disaster relief organization in the state of South Carolina. She's their director. And my son-in-law is a graduate of Georgetown Law School, and he's a lawyer. But my son-in-law grew up in the home of a Baptist preacher. He went to a Bible college. But thankfully, he was smart. And the smartest thing he ever did was to marry my daughter. <laughs> but he's such a blessing. Their relationship, however, started with God. They sought God. They prayed. They asked God to lead them. My son Stephen, who's almost about to be 30, he's Isaac's friend, he's married. His wife was from Japan, but she was an American. Her parents were missionaries. She has an American body, but she has a Japanese brain. So my son loves Asians. And um, I'm so thankful. Uh, I told my son one day, he brought a girl home one day, and I said, not going to be good, son. He said, why, Dad? I said, I just know. It's not going to work. I said, here's what's going to happen. You're going to marry her, leave us, you'll never see us again. He looked at me. He said, how do you know that? I said, I know. I said, I, I don't think she's a good fit for you. And he struggled with that because he liked her. But you don't just marry somebody because you like them. You marry somebody because it's God's will. You marry somebody because you seek the Lord. 
And so that relationship ended. The other girl, next girl came along, the one he married. I said, she's a good girl. I said, two thumbs up. My oldest daughter, she's 36. She's not married. My youngest son's 21. He's met a girl and he's ready to marry her tomorrow. I said, no. <laughs> but it all starts in your relationship with God. The first time I met my wife, I met her in church. Church is a great place to meet your wife. I met her in Sunday school. The way I met her was it was a Sunday school class of about 80 people, about the size we have this morning, all college students. And the Sunday school teacher was about to teach, but he had a girl get up to sing. It was the Sunday school teacher's girlfriend. This girl got up, and there were two things about her I noticed. Number one, she was absolutely stunningly beautiful. Secondly, when she sang, she sounded angelic. I thought, who is this angel? After Sunday school, I was standing out in the lobby of the church, and the girl that sang came walking up to me. She said, are you Steve Pettit? I went, uh-huh. <laughs> she said, I have a note for you from your girlfriend. I got the note and thought, I think I like you better. <laughs> well, she was not engaged, but she was dating the Sunday school teacher in the class. I thought, well, okay, it's not God's will. A year goes by, and the next summer I'm working in the church as an intern, and that friend of mine, the Sunday school teacher, he and I were the same age, had been out traveling all summer preaching. And at the end of the summer, he had come back. I had just graduated from college. I told you I went to a military school. My degree was in business administration, and I was going to graduate school that fall for my seminary, just like your pastor did. And so I'm working in this church in the summertime, and my friend is back. And then I noticed the girl, remember the angel? She was in church that day too. She had been working all summer in a Christian camp and came home. And I noticed they weren't sitting together. So it aroused my curiosity. I said, are you still dating Terry? He said, no, we broke up. I went, too bad. <laughs> so I went to the other side of the auditorium after church, and I walked up to her and I said, hi. She said, hello. I said, how are you doing? She said, fine. I said, so what you doing this fall? She said, well, I'm actually going to go to Bob Jones University. I went, really? So am I. <laughs> And so I went to Bob Jones University and I saw her one day after chapel and I gave her a phone call and I said, can we go out on a date? And at Bob Jones University, your dating options were always limited. There were only so many places you could go. They were very strict about dating. And you could either go to a place where it looked like a big room with, with couches and it was called the dating parlor. And you could go and sit there on a couch for two hours. That was a date. Or you could go to a soccer match and watch the game. The soccer matches were two games, so they were longer, so everybody wanted to go to the soccer match. <laughs> so I took her to the soccer match. I have no idea. I love soccer. I have no idea who, who played. I don't know who won the game, but it was the most <laughs> delightful experience I'd had. For two hours, we sat there and we talked. And you know what we talked about? We talked about our relationship with God. And we both quoted Psalm 73, whom do I have in heaven but thee, and there's none upon earth I desire besides thee. We had made a decision that God was first in our life. And from that day forward, I knew I wanted to marry her. Thankfully, I did. And now we've been married 38 years with four children and three grandchildren later. Now, my point is this. Are you a Christian who has a meaningful relationship with God? That's the foundation for the right home. Secondly, are you engaged in effective Bible study? The study of the Bible is not just a means of knowledge, it's a source of grace. I want you to understand that. There are even Christians who view the Bible as a source of knowledge. Yes, it's a source of knowledge, but actually it's the means of grace. You see, living the Christian life is not something that's hard to do, it's something that's impossible to do. What is grace? Grace says, I can't, but God can. I can't change. I can't be loving. I cannot be what I'm not by nature. I don't study the Bible just to learn what I'm to do or how I'm to do it, 
but to know God and have God work in me and through me. God works in you in order to work through you. Biblical leadership then involves God working in you first through His Word. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 3.18, But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed. That verse is speaking about one who reads the Scripture. And in the reading of the Bible, they just don't learn about God, but they see God. And just like Moses saw God on the mountaintop, and his face began to glow and shine, and he was changed. So God changes you through the reading of the Word. I always have hope for people to change if they read their Bible. But if a Christian rarely spends time in the Word, I have little hope that he will ever change because he will always be subjugated to his own nature. But through the grace of God, we overcome our natures. We rise above. We change. And so God is working in you, both the will and the do of his good pleasure. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The Bible was not written to be a family manual or a handbook on mar marriage. You really don't find a lot about specifically marriage in the Bible. You have a lot. I mean, it's there, but that's not the purpose of it. The purpose of the Bible is to show you who God is, to show you who Jesus is, to show you who you are, and to show you who you are to become. You should be found every day reading your Bible. Your children should catch you reading your Bible. Your children should see you in the Word. Because when the parents, especially the father, is reading the Bible, it creates an atmosphere of reverence in the home. You should talk about the Bible throughout the day. We read about this in Deuteronomy. It says you're supposed to talk about the Bible when you're sitting down, when you're getting up, when you're walking by the way. I was a camp director at a Christian camp in northern Wisconsin in the summer times. We lived nine miles from the camp, and so it was a 15-minute, well, it was a 13 to 15-minute drive depending on how many deer I had to avoid. <laughs> and my son Michael, who's our youngest, he's now 21, but when he was born, his sisters were 15 and 13, so he was definitely the baby of the family. So he would always ride with me. And if I ever tried to turn on music to listen to, he always turned it off. You know why? Because he wanted to talk to me. And so I used those little 13-minute conversations over a period of years to just share with him simple truths about life. Read your Bible to your children. Spend time with them. My son Stephen, friend of Isaac, when he was uh, a junior and senior in high school, we got up together every morning, every single morning, and we would read the Bible and we would read theology. Now, to be honest with you, I didn't know how much Stephen was really getting. Because sometimes we would read, uh, we would read a book. The fact is, we, re we read a book by Thomas Watson, a Puritan, on, on this, I think it's the, it was something of divinity or study of divinity. But it's actually a very interesting book. But I knew sometimes he wasn't getting it because he'd be sitting there and I'd be reading and he'd be going, I didn't know if he got it, but when he went off to college and he was sitting in classes, I suddenly realized he got it because he was asking very astute questions. And it goes back, I believe, to that time that we spend in the Word. Help your children develop an appetite for the Bible. I had, I had a few key goals for my children, but let me tell you what my goal was not. My goal was not primarily for my children to get a good education, to get a good job, although I wanted all of that. My, my, my goal, and, and actually some of this comes from the Jewish culture, the Jewish people, had three goals for their children. Number one, that they would know the Bible, they would know God. Number two, that they would marry the right person in life. And number three, they would develop a skill that they could take care of themselves financially. That's three, good, that's three good things. But the number one was that they would know God. And so I set it a goal that by the time my children graduated from high school, that they would be spending time in the Bible every day, every single day. You know what's wonderful? is for my 36-year-old daughter to tell me she still has her devotions. 
Or my son wakes up in the morning, gets him a cup of coffee, and he sits down and he takes his Bible and he reads it. Or even more so, he's reading his Bible to my grandson. I love that. But the point I would like to make is this. Biblical leadership in the home begins with you being a Christian and then you are effectively engaged in personal Bible study. And then number three, the third principle I'd like to share about biblical leadership in the home, and this sounds very simple, but it's very important, and that is that you actually need to be praying for wisdom. Last night I was speaking over on the west side of town here and a pastor's wife came up to me. And she has three children, two little boys and a young baby daughter. And she said, do you have any wisdom you'd like to share with me about raising children in a Christian family and so forth? And of course, I thanked her for that. And I don't feel like I have a lot of wisdom because most of us learn through the school of hard knocks. But if I've learned anything, and if I've learned anything in the last four years, for sure, being at Bob Jones University, is that praying for wisdom is no, is no religious ritual. Because if you have children, they will push you beyond the wisdom that you have. Because they will do things or things will happen in your life that you don't know the answer. And praying for wisdom presupposes that you don't know what to do. Have you ever noticed we're always experts at raising everyone else's children? <laughs> Why, if that was my son, I would never let him do that. Well, he's not, so be quiet. We're all experts, especially when we're married without children. But you know what? When you get your own children, God's going to show you how wise you aren't and how much you need God. And so James chapter 1 verse 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And by the way, that word if is a presupposing that you do. Parents fail without God's wisdom for the occasion. No book is going to give you the answer to every problem. You need God. Wisdom is about making right decisions right now that are, in that, are, that are in alignment with God's purposes and plans. Your child is unique. If you have more than one child, you realize how unique God is because He made them so different. So different. My two daughters are very different. My two sons... They're so different. My son Stephen, when he was a little bit, little guy, I would slap him and punch him and push him around and he would fall on the floor and roll over laughing. He loved it. I did that to my second son. Pushed him around, slapped him, and he looked at me and he said, would you please not do that again? <laughs> totally different. You have to have wisdom of knowing how to respond to situations and how to guide them and how not to frustrate them. Because yes, if you think children frustrate parents, what about parents frustrating children? Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Fathers can be provocative. Fathers can frustrate children. And so therefore, you need to pray for wisdom. And where do we get wisdom? According to James chapter 1, wisdom always comes through the pathway of trials. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. For what? Well, read the preceding verses. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing the trying of your faith is working patience. Wisdom is gained through the pathway of pressure and stress. I've walked out on the back porch of my home in Wisconsin when I lived there many times when nobody was around and held up my hands to God and say, oh God, give me wisdom. I pray that you'll help me to know what to do here. Things will force you, trials will force you into dependence and guidance from God. So pray for wisdom. That's biblical leadership. And then number four, and this is so important, and that is to center your social and spiritual life around the life of your local church. Everybody here has a life. We only have so many hours in a day. Most of our time in a day is taken up with things of responsibility, whether it's education or work. 
And then outside of that, you have family. So your work, your education, your family, and then, then you have a little bit left over. What do you do with that little bit left over? Let me encourage you to center and build your social and spiritual life around the life of the local church. My wife and I made a vow in our wedding to be committed to building our lives around the church. It actually was in our wedding vows. We are united to Christ, we are baptized into his body, then we cannot separate our spiritual life from our church life. Your children learn by your example. When you are faithful to church, it tells your children what is important to you as a parent. Your children will learn your values. They will know what's important to you. You can't hide that. As I mentioned, I met my wife in church. I was married in church. My kids grew up in church. So center your social and spiritual life around the activities and the life of the local church. Support your pastor and the church's program. Be careful <clears throat> about your tongue. You know, in the local church, if you think about it, except for where you work and where you go to school, most of your friends are in church. So if you're going to gossip, who are you going to talk about? You know, you can't talk about people you don't know. And so there is a tendency among God's people to Talk about each other. Be careful. Be careful about being criti critical because criticism goes a long way, sadly. Do not allow criticism and disagreements to be the center of your family conversation. As we say back in the U United States, don't have roast preacher on Sunday after Sunday morning sermon. You know, my children, and they'll, they, if they were here, they'd tell you this. My children... Never heard me criticize a pastor's sermon growing up. Did I ever hear some worth criticizing? Yes. Did I ever hear a bad sermon from the pastor? Sure. Try to be a pastor and have a good sermon every week. <laughs> but I did hear the word, and God was there. So speak kindly of God's people. Speak kindly of God's people. Involve time in serving through your church. My wife's, my dates with my wife when we were married were oftentimes through things we would do with the church and they were our best dates. Every Thursday morning for the first five years of our marriage, we would do visitation for the church. We would go into people's homes. And you know what we would do? My wife, I'd pick her up at 10 o'clock in the morning and we would go out and we would visit sometimes church members, sometimes we would visit visitors, unbelievers, but we would visit for two hours and usually we'd get in one or two calls and either we would comfort the saints or we would, um, or we would evangelize the lost and then afterwards we'd go out to eat lunch. Best time of the week. We were serving God together and we were eating together. I mean, it can't get any better than that. Then number five, consider this. You have to work through all the normal areas of tension that come in marriage. You know, marriage brings tensions. You bring two and make them one, you have issues to work through. The book of Proverbs in chapter 22, verse 3 says, A prudent man foresees the evil and he hides himself. A wise person learns how to be a good hider. I was in Israel a few weeks ago. And one of the animals you see when you go to Israel <clears throat> is an animal you read about in the Bible. It looks like a large rat or maybe a combination of a rat and a squirrel. Do you have squirrels here? Okay. The animal is called a coney. Have you ever heard of a coney you read about in the Bible? Rock, badger, some, call, some version call it. Do you know what they're known for? They're known for one thing. They're known for hiding. It says that the conies hide, their wisdom is that they hide them in the rocks to protect them. You know, there's a lot of wisdom in learning how to hide from problems. Now, now I'm, not, I'm not talking about running away from them, but how to deal with them. What are the most, what are the, what are the most common areas of tension in marriage? Now, I'm probably entering into a few cultural areas, 
So I'll throw them out there and let you sort of decipher them in your own situation. One of the great problems in marriage is money. And when you get married, you have to determine how are you going to handle the money that comes into the family. And there needs to be great unity over that. If I've learned anything, you need to be in alignment in your thinking. So if you're in a family where both of you are working jobs, then you have to decide how are you going to work together to get synergy financially. Money can be a problem. Budgeting, tithing, I believe in tithing to the local church. How do we handle debt? Because debt brings pressure. But it is of the utmost importance that you handle it with clarity. In my family, uh, we decided, my wife and I, we decided that I would take care of the primary responsibility of the finances. Doesn't mean that she doesn't have anything to do with it. Actually, she does very well with it. She has a credit card. So she does very well with it. <laughs> but, 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 we have, but after 38 years of marriage, we worked our system out. Second area has to do with your in-laws, your family. Have you ever heard of a mother-in-law? <laughs> a father-in-law? Now, I don't know how it is in your culture, please. I, I only know mine. But generally, in the way that it works in a husband and wife relationship with the in-laws, is that the wife generally wants to be more with her family than she does with your family. Now, I don't know if that's true in yours, but it's definitely true in mine. Because my family, my father, my father's passed away, and my mother's 87, so it's a little different now, but I'm going back a few years ago. My father and mother were sort of formal and sometimes a little uncomfortable. My wife's family, everything was a party. <laughs> and there are 17 grandchildren in that family, 17 grandchildren, and they love their grandmother. And when they come over to the grandmother's house, they fall on the floor, they fall on the couch, they go into the kitchen, and grandmother's always making them something to eat, and everybody's laughing. Fact is, in my wife's family, they laugh, they laugh at their own statements. <laughs> my family's totally opposite. I thought that was so weird. <laughs> you know, they would, make, they would make their own statement, and then they would start laughing. I thought, why are you laughing at your own statement? But that's her family, it's different. And so there had to be adjustments. Third area is in the demands of work. The greatest threat to your marriage is your job and actually your children. Did you know that? The greatest threat to your marriage is your job and your children. Your job, why? Because it takes so much time. Um, <laughs> it's, very, it's very interesting, the last four years coming to Bob Jones University, I came to Bob Jones, I was 58 years old. My children had grown. I didn't think my children cared about seeing me too much, so I just gave myself to the work. My wife and the work, that was it. I, and I work round the clock, all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. And I didn't worry about it because my children are grown. They're out of the house. And my children sat me down one day and they looked at me and they said, Dad, right now, you're terrible. I went, what? They said, you're so consumed with the work. I said, so? You're not here. They said, well, we know, but we don't like it. Because even in their 30s, they wanted my attention. Because they were used to having it. You know what? What gets our attention is what's important to us. Therefore, you have to have the demands of work. You know, I've told people, the greatest threat to my spiritual life is being the president of Bob Jones University. It's the greatest threat. It's the greatest threat I have. You know why? Because it consumes me so much. You know what? If I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, guess what I'm thinking about? I'm thinking about my work. But that is a threat. And so, therefore, you have to work through these things in wedding, in marriage, and in the family. And then I mentioned the raising of children. Coming of children in your life is a great blessing and it changes your life. My daughter-in-law, she has three children under three. Think about that. 
Three under three. Three, two, one. That's what it is. And they all have birthdays. This, the, two of them have birthdays this summer. They'll be three and two. And then, this, and then the, the third one, the youngest one, has a birthday, I think, in January. You know what her life is like? Three under three? It's incessant. <laughs> Children all day long. Fact is, it's a diaper factory. <laughs> all day long, all day long, all day long, all day long, all day long. And then my son, after working all day, comes home. You know, after you're working all day, you come home, you're tired. And you know what he does when he walks in the house? He takes off his work hat and he puts on his father hat. And he has to be just as engaged. <clears throat> and when you have three under three, guess what? They don't always sleep all night. And they wake you up in the middle of the night. So you are perpetually tired. And you are under stress because those little kids keep you moving. Our, our oldest grandson, his name is Judah. Their names are Judah, Shiloh, and Luca. And Judah is the funnest boy to be with. He's cute, he's, he's happy, but he's mischievous. One day he woke up before his mother and dad got up and he went into the kitchen. He was two years old. He went into the kitchen, he's very intelligent, took a chair and pushed it up to the count counter, climbed up on the chair, climbed up on the counter, opened the cabinet, and there was a huge bag of donuts. And they were the, they were the white kind of donuts that were, uh, you know, when you bite them, they go everywhere. And so he took the whole bag of donuts down, got down, went back in his bedroom, crawled in his bed with his other brother, and opened the bag and they ate all the donuts. <laughs> and the donuts were not in their mouth, they were in their bed, in their sheets, in their floor, and everywhere. And they were deliriously happy. <laughs> but you know what, that's stressful for a parent. And you know what, it's not just little children that bring stress, it's teenagers. And you would think that when they graduate from high school and they move on, that all your problems go away. They don't. They continue on. And all of these things, expectations at home, in-laws, are all areas of tension that you have to work through. But this is a part of being a biblical leader in the family. And then number five, embrace a biblical philosophy of child raising. Biblical leadership in the home has a biblical philosophy of child raising, and I would highly recommend that you spend time looking at the scriptures, study the Bible, particularly the passages of scripture that directly speak about fathers and sons and children. Go through the book of Proverbs and read it very carefully. Understand your role as a father. Memorize your verses. Talk through the philosophy with your, with your wife. When my wife and I started having children, we walked through in our mind and talked through a process of discipline. How would we discipline our children? If I've learned anything about disciplining your children, that the most important thing is that you be consistent. There will always be levels, if I could say it this way, of what you permit and what you restrict as a parent. There are some parents that are stricter than other parents. There's no uniformity in child discipline. Okay, But there is one thing that we all should be uniform in, and that is we should be consistent. We should be consistent. And we should balance our discipline always with truth and love. Always. There's a tendency to be permissive, and there's a tendency to be oppressive. I told people at Bob Jones University, if I have any goal at Bob Jones in our discipline, which we have at Bob Jones, is not to be oppressive, and it's not to be permissive. I said, that's good parenting. That you be consistent. When you have to apply the discipline in areas that are painful, that you are very clear in your processes, that you always discipline, not in anger. And by the way, children will make you angry. But you discipline them in love, self-control. 
The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness, meekness, temperance, faith. And that's all to be applied in all the areas of our life, especially in the raising of our children. Seek to be consistent. Work together. And be firm. Do not let your children play one parent against the other because they are professionals at it. And they never went to school to learn that. Your children will push you to a limit. My son Michael, who's now 21, when he was a little, really little, uh, was very stubborn, extremely stubborn. He was probably two years old. And one morning, uh, I got up, made my coffee. I was reading my Bible, sitting on the couch, and he was sleeping a little in a little uh, port. We called it a porta crib. And he woke up. And he was he was like I say, he was two years old. He woke up, and he looked at me. He wanted to get out of bed because he wanted to go get in bed with his mother. And he looked at me and he said, "Out." <laughs> I said, "Do you want to get out, son?" He said, mm "Hmm." I said, "Say please." He went. I looked at him and thought, maybe he didn't understand me. Son, do you want to get out? Mm -hmm. Say please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, son, if you don't say please, you will never see your mother the rest of your life. <laughs> I said, say please. He went. Mm -hmm. So we had a couple of sessions of motivation. He still never said please. I said, son, if you don't say please, I am not going to let you. I'm not, you're not going to go see your mother. Well, mother came down, and she looked at said, what's happening? And I said, and she said, she looked at him, and she said, you say please. He went, hmm. Two and a half hours later, he finally said please. The next morning, we, we uh, did the same thing. I got up, had my devotions, reading my Bible. He was sleeping. He woke up and he stood up and he looked at me and he said, juice. <laughs> I said, do you want some juice, son? He said, mm. I said, say please. Mm. <laughs> I thought, oh, no. <laughs> I said, son, if you, don't say ju if you don't say please, you will never drink anything the rest of your life. I said, son, it's two against one. Your mother and father are against you. You will never win. <laughs> I came home at 11 o'clock in the morning. This was at 8 o'clock. And he had still not said please. And finally, about lunchtime, he said please. So I thought, am I being too hard on him? Am I just, do I not understand? And I was... I was puzzled by it. I was stretched. And the next day, I got up early and left. And I came home at lunchtime, and he was up on the bed where his mother was, laying there. And I grabbed him and kind of fell on top of him and started kissing him, and he went, please, please, please. please. <laughs> so your children are going to push you. Embrace a biblical philosophy of child raising. Well, my time is almost done. I have other things here. I talk here about guarding your children. Today, <clears throat> we have to be careful. Evil communication corrupts good morals. One of the greatest threats to your children's morality is something you need to be aware of. What is it? You better know the answer. It's called technology. How many of you have children that have a cell phone? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you have children that have access to the internet? Sure. Is there anything wrong with it? No, of course not. The fact is you can't survive today without that knowledge. We understand that. But evil communication corrupts good morals. Evil communication corrupts good morals. And therefore, especially in the raising of your children up through the high school years, you as a parent need to be aware of what are they looking at. At Bob Jones University, without a doubt, this is a Christian university, without a doubt, one of the greatest struggles that we have in helping our young men live for God 
is the amount of pornography they had available to them on the internet as a teenager. And it is damaging to their soul. Why? Because evil communication corrupts good morals. Many young people today get their view of life, they get their view of life through the internet. Education is coming through the internet. Communication is coming through the internet. FaceTiming and texting and Instagram and, and, and Snapchat and all that goes with the social media sites. And, and by the way, they never end. They just keep coming. It is of the utmost importance that your children are guarded and that you protect them and do not make assumptions that they are not perhaps looking at things that are damaging to them. And then let me say, and I'll finish with this, I have determined your child's education. I think education is a big thing. Uh, looking for mentors and counselors. I, I learned something that I am not capable. I, I, I don't have everything that my children need. I need. They need good mentors and good counselors. But as I finish, let me just say this. Let your family abound with love and affection. Make your home a place where your children want to come and not leave. Fill your home, fill your home, fill your home with words of love, affection, appreciation. Let your children see mom and dad. Now this may be a little cultural, but it works in our culture. Let them see you kiss. My kids know that kissing is my favorite indoor sport. <laughs> and tell your children you love them and write words of affection and appreciation because you know what? One day they're going to end up maybe, maybe drifting a little bit, but they can't get away from their father and their mother's love. There was a young man in the Bible who broke his father's heart. He said, Father, give me my goods. Give me my inheritance. And he took it, and he went out and wasted it, spent it on parties and prostitutes. And one day he woke up, and he realized that it was much better at his father's house. And as he was making his way home, his father saw him afar off. And what did the father do? He ran after him and fell on his neck and he kissed him. And I wonder, you know, I wonder, I wonder, because we don't know the relationship of the father with the son that much, but did that boy all along know that his father loved him because kissing him on the neck was not, that wasn't the first time he ever did that. That somewhere that boy knew that no matter how bad he was, his father still loved him. Parents are an expression of the Heavenly Father. So please make sure your family abounds with love and affection. May we pray. Father, thank you for your grace and goodness. Thank you for the word that you've given us. Thank you for the practical lessons that we learn about life. Help us to be good parents, Lord. We all feel that we have so many needs in this area, but help us to be biblical leaders at home. In Jesus' name, amen.